Hello my pink lady apples and welcome to another trophy ranking from yours truly. So far we've covered some of the nastiest trophies in gaming. The worst grinds, the cruelest trophies, the grindiest multiplayer trophies, doom and gloom am I right? Life is miserable enough so let's shift the focus off the crap and check out something a bit more interesting. Today I want to talk all about the puzzling. 10 trophies you'd never know how to do without a guide. 10 trophies that you end up having to look online for or ask a friend about and when you finally crack it you sit there and wonder how the hell it was ever figured out in the first place. Trophies that ask for more than just a careful eye, but a hound dog levels of sniffing about, the ability to trip and fall into secret rooms and locations, and a level of intuition I will never understand. Games that sit there like an angry girlfriend that wants you to take out the bins, but don't want to tell you to do it because you live there and telling you is half the battle. Except instead of bins it's like collectibles or miscellaneous secrets so tucked away that you'd need x-ray vision and the nose of a truffle pig just to know where to begin. As my usual lists go, we're only going to be discussing games I've played myself. This is no copy pace list. This is free range trauma. That means that if my choices differ from yours, it's because we've played different games, so share those with me. And before I begin, if you like this video, please drop a like, comment some of your own trophies or achievements you never would have gotten without a bit of useful advice, and subscribe to me here on YouTube. I post trophy rankings, game reviews, and all sorts of shit chat, so if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, make sure you subscribe so you never miss another upload from me. Furthermore, I stream most days over on Twitch, so check out twitch.tv slash if you want to see me grabbing these obscure trophies. He's live. Thanks very much and let's get started with the video. 35mm is a brilliantly atmospheric, tense walking simulator produced by a tiny indie dev team based out of Russia. As all independent games go, the movement can be clunky and the exploration a little more limited than the maps imply, but some of the more haunting scenes look straight out of Darkwood meets Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, and it's a worthwhile platinum trophy so I recommend it. Particularly for anyone who enjoys exploration games, puzzle games or games that spend a lot of time implying you're about to shit yourself. 35mm has a solid enough length to make your boyfriend jealous, not that that would take much L and spans over the course of several locations with a bunch of associated miscellaneous trophies. Some of them bear descriptions that give you enough insight into what's required that you have a solid clue on where to start, such as opening the safe in the city or finding the mannequin room, but Top Secret simply asks that you find all secret documents in the safe. What safe? The one in the city? No you sad moron, obviously not. The safe in Boar, a location from earlier in the game. For access to this safe you need to load the chapter, walk round to the right and head through a gap in a fence to assess an electrical substation. Opening the door you might think it's an empty room but it's not. Look bottom right for a power pack. Now beware, as if you die during this chapter, the power pack won't be in your inventory and it might not respawn here either, so you have to head all the way back into chapter select if you want this again. You might even need to delete your save and come back later. When you've got the power pack you need to progress through the level until you reach a huge atrium and then take a corridor with a tripwire in it that will definitely kill you the first time around. At the end of this fairly innocent corridor in the final room on the right there will be a wooden box on the floor with wires poking out. This is where your power pack goes. The power pack will trigger a projector to activate showing you tons of numbers. You only need four of these but the game doesn't tell you which four you need. You need to walk back up the corridor making sure again not to die and back up the stairs you came from. Up some more stairs, left door, right room, turn right and then the safe is right there. To know it's specifically this map, to know to find that power pack, to know what those numbers mean, sure the most thorough players might trip and fall into an achievement like that, but me? Well, I googled it. Which is one of those classic walking simulators that posits an interesting concept, raises some mind-boggling questions, then just kind of fizzles out like a birthday candle on the bathroom floor. For people who enjoy subtle storytelling, it's definitely up there. For me, I was a bit bored, but I appreciated what it was trying to do. One trophy that absolutely blew my mind with its obscurity was the DLC trophy, Al Shoshone, a miscellaneous trophy that's sort of a collectible, being that there's only one to pick up that asks you to find and listen to a tape called Al Shoshone. How are you supposed to do this is utterly beyond me. There are two major components as to why this trophy is so obscure. Firstly, it is completely hidden. Around the map are several concealed bramble bushes, subtly hidden amongst all the other non-interactive bramble bushes. You can chop them down, revealing little secret areas you can go and sit in, but they're very very hard to see. I guess you can take a look at the map and check out copses and gaps you've not seen before, but it's a big map and it takes a thorough combing to notice all these gaps in the hedges. It's a needle in a haystack kind of shit. Secondly, it cannot be discovered until day 77. Despite the game taking place on a huge 
huge map is very linear story-wise. As such, there are only a few playable days in this game, day 77 being one of the final ones, and this is because you need the axe to access this collectible. Bramble bushes can't be removed with that one, even though they're about knee height and you could probably easily just step over them. Once you've reached the correct day, secured this necessary tool, and used your theoretically bloodhound level intuition to even locate this El Dorado of bramble bushes, you'll find it. Old Shoshone is located in some kind of old campsite, or at least a place where people went and sat once, because there's a chair and a table and a few other bits and pieces. Most importantly, the cassette, Old Shoshone, that you need to pick up and listen to for this trophy. As it plays, da ding, congratulations. If you're one of the geniuses that located this without help or guidance, consider joining the FBI, because your skills need to be used in missing children's cases. If you weren't, you're like me, and we have a PSN Profiles Guide writer to thank for their sacrifice. VA-11 Hall A, or Valhalla, as you'll call it if you are not an absolute train wreck, is a curious game about bartending. It's not so much about making drinks as it is about getting to know your clientele, watching stories unfold in front of you, and receiving weird messaging about the age of consent. At first I thought it was a bad port, but I came to realise that it doesn't play too well on PC either, specifically the drink-making minigame that asks you to turn your analogue stick in the direction of the ingredient you want to add, but there are five ingredients which makes the required angle always just a little bit funny, and I found myself reloading loading saves a lot just because I'd make mistakes based on that, and not because I didn't actually know the drinks. Anyway, almost all the drinks in the game are shown in the recipe book, which can be accessed at any time whilst making drinks so you don't have to memorise them. Some of them, however, are not in the recipe book. I'm not sure how you're ever supposed to know how to make them unless there's some hidden dialogue or a post-credits note that I missed, and for the trophy An Old Friend, you need to serve one of these hidden drinks to one specific NPC during one specific time in this entire 11 hour game, or two hours if you skip all the dialogue. The clue for this trophy is in the description and the trophy image, we are told a certain old drink might bring Dana's old friend to the bar. So at least we know that it needs to be Dana we serve the drink to. Oh wait, no, we don't serve the drink to Dana. We need to serve a character called Kim, who doesn't actually have anything to do with Dana or the bar at all. I'm not sure the two even share dialogue. So good luck knowing what to do there. The image is of an Easter Island head drink, the Flaming Maui, and get this, the number of required ingredients is derived from the Fibonacci sequence. One of the first, one of the second, two, then three, then five. Like why would you think to even do that in the first place? No one ever asks for it, it's not in the recipe book, so what kind of maths nerd figured this one out? Anyway, you serve Kim this drink and then for some disjointed reason, four days later, a furry shows up at your door and the trophy pops. You know, the classic situation, matter can't be created or destroyed, only transformed, and in this case it's a cat-eared woman. If you didn't know that one led to the other, you'd probably be quite confused. Grim Fandango is a LucasArts game, and for those of you that are familiar with LucasArts games, you'll know it was very, very hard not to put all of them on this list. Day of the Tentacle, Monkey Island, Zombies Ate My Neighbours, and in the end, I picked Grim Fandango, considering it's one of the most charming games I've ever played. Grim Fandango sees you playing as Mally Calavera, a travel agent for the Department of Death. Together, you barely manage to blunder your way through the game using some of the best developer logic on the planet, never mind the Platinum Trophy. LucasArts always has my favourite untested logic. You'll get to a big door, and you you'll need a key, and the key will turn out to be half a tin of baked beans glued to an old cat skeleton, and somehow it'll make just enough sense that you can't complain. Many of the trophies in this game rely not only on absurd logic, innuendo, and out of the box thinking, but also timing, specifically Oh Rusty Anchor, one of the trickiest trophies of the game, being that it's not only easy to miss, but also easy to sabotage, as you can accidentally lock yourself out of it for the rest of the playthrough if you give one of the side characters an item too easily. For the trophy Oh Rusty Anchor, you need Glottis, your best friend and confidant, to sing the song Oh Rusty Anchor anchor while playing the piano. Simple, yes? No, you mug, this is a LucasArts game. During your second year of the game, because yes, this game spans four years, why do you ask, you'll spot a woman called Lola taking a photo of two people having an affair. Since we all know snitches get stitches, we can see where this is going to head, but regardless we head up to the casino, get a VIP pass, and to advance the story we need to give this to Glottis. But giving it to Glottis will make him move, so let's backtrack. Instead we go to the VIP room ourselves and we speak to a lawyer called Virago, the fella having the affair earlier. We threaten him, he gets upset, he leaves, leaving a cigarette case that we can steal. We need to get into it, but we can't. So we take it to the security officer, Vala. Mm -hmm. I remember this one town we moved to when I was in the first grade. Oh really? 
Yeah, the only industry in the area was figs. Acres and acres of fig trees everywhere you looked. You don't say. And have her blow it up, obviously. She will give us the key. We take the key with zero guidance on where it goes and eventually find it opens the lighthouse. We head inside to see what happened to Lola and we get a small tile. The tile obviously goes to a coat room, you moron, and you take the associated coat by swapping it for the tile. We take out the coat and investigate it to finally find it. The rusty anchor. A little note with the song on it. We take it to Glottis, hand it over, and he'll sing it. And then since the trophy is really buggy and it doesn't always pop, we might ask him to sing it again. And again. And then we might ask him to sing it, but this time we don't skip it. And then we might ask him to sing it and then walk away and leave the room and come back in again. And then we might ask him to sing it and finally get the trophy. And after all this time, we have it. The rusty anchor. And it's finally time. The brilliant friend that you are, you send Glottis to his doom by giving him the VIP pass that you got at the start, knowing full well that he's a recovering addict. For all those boomers that bitch they don't make games like they used to, maybe there's a reason. The Return of the Obradin is a game one person might describe as visually unique, striking, and artistically innovative, and another person might describe as a bit annoying to play because you're never quite sure what you're looking at. Style-wise, Obradin uses a one-bit monochromatic graphical style, a description that means very little to me because I've got the design knowledge of an ex cheapy manga artist who churned out illustrations on Fiverr at 20 minutes apiece to pay her rent through university, but I can assure you that it works exactly as art does. It gets on your nerves, but you're too inferior to feel like you're justified in criticising it. Anyway, the story of the return of the Obra Dinn sees you investigating a ship which has, shockingly, returned, except with its whole crew missing, besides a few bits and pieces of bone. You're given a cool time watch with a brilliant gimmick, you point it at remains and it takes you back to the moment of their death in a still image, so you can wander around and see what exactly was transpiring at the moment they died. You can also click on other people during that image and see how they died too, creating a series of deaths you can walk through to put together a picture of what happened. Honestly, it's a really interesting story. At first it looks like a mutiny, but as you begin to hop through the events that took place, you'll see a real picture come to life of sirens, crab monsters, and the Kraken itself, told to you through still images and well-acted voiceovers. If you're the kind of person who loves data entry, carefully picking through scenes, and seeing glimpses of stories that were probably far more interesting to a live through in the moment, you'll love this. And weirdly, I don't mean any disrespect by that. For the niche this game serves, it is very, very good at serving it. As you gather more information, you'll begin to fill your logbook. Name, picture, cause of death. Slowly, piece by piece, you get an image of what happened here, and by the end of the game, you should have a a pretty clear idea of what happened to most people on board. Except for the trophy Captain Did It, you need to identify the captain and then blame him for every single death on board. Literally, one by one, select him as the cause of death for every person on the boat. It takes a long, long time, picking through every person, selecting the cause of death, picking killed by, and then scrolling down to the captain's name. There are 60 odd people on the boat and they all need to have been seen in order for you to identify them. So you'll be right at the end of the game by the time you embark on this journey of admin. Once this is finally done, you can hop onto the the boat out of there and the trophy will pop in the final moments of the game. Voila! 20 minutes well spent. Resident Evil 7 is a great game with an extremely fun 100%, probably one of my favourite 100%s of all time. The base list is a good combination of challenge, fun and exploration, asking you to play the game on several difficulties, under certain constraints, finding certain items and completing certain requirements, tucking under bosses' attacks, scaring away roaming bosses and trying the wrong items in shadow puzzles. Sure, the story quality peters off hard around the halfway mark and Jack gets reused harder than Ubisoft's typical gameplay template, but I can't remember the last time I had felt a brilliantly equal mix of terror, excitement and satisfaction. And I occasionally date men, so that's an achievement. Another thing Resident Evil 7 brought to the table was its DLC. We had an Escape Room DLC, a Blackjack DLC, a Trial and Error Gauntlet DLC, a Fist Sony DLC, and beautifully a Prologue DLC. A spicy extra bit of story for you to get a bit more information about the Baker family, who they were, and how they became what they are now. This DLC was called Daughters. It explained how Evelyn wound up in the Baker household and how her eerie supernatural vice grip on their minds and bodies began. It's a story DLC so you play as Zoe in the final moments of her family's sanity. If you play the game naturally, you'll get the bad ending. Yes, you might be surprised to see that as Zoe runs into the garage to escape her terrifying parents, they ambush her and drag her away. Bad ending. But for one instinct survival, you need the good ending, so how do we do that? Well, if you're some sort of Poirot-style detective, you'll need to watch Lucas sit down at the table at the start of the story. He'll input his passcode into his phone, 1019, and you need to remember that for later. Next, you head into the pantry 
tree next to where Marguerite is cooking, drop down into the hole in the floor and crawl under the house to find the lockpick that I guess maybe fell between the cracks in the floorboards or was left there by helpful woodland animals. When you're given clothes, you head upstairs to Lucas's room and unlock the locked drawer with said lockpick. You'll find a red button. This red button needs to be placed inside a lamp in the corner of the room near a ladder that you'll then need to climb. You then input the password Lucas used earlier in the computer. Do you remember it? As the game continues, you eventually run from Jack. You need to know to tie the bar door closed, then go to Granny's room, grab a fork, and then use that to pry nails off the window. You'll hop out onto the veranda, but you're not safe yet. Instead of following the intended route, you need to go elsewhere and find a red dog head. Now you can drop down, use the head to escape, and run. And there's your good ending. Like I said, if you're Sherlock Holmes, you might have gotten it naturally, but if you're me, well, most people I guess, you'll go to Google. Same result. Borderlands is hardly a niche series. I remember even before I properly got into gaming, back when I was a desperate Nintendo fangirl, I was well aware of Borderlands. The art style, the psychos, the music, it's all iconic stuff and a truly unique universe fleshed out upon the course of years by writers who loved every second of making it. The third game, for better or worse, happened, and despite my grievances with it, it was a simple story with a selection of clear, consistent and doable trophies. Master of All You Survey is a trophy with a familiar concept in the Borderlands universe. To earn this trophy, you need to discover every location in the base game. This is every location in every map of the game. The base levels of Pandora, Eden 6, Promethea and Necrodefeo, plus the hub world of Sanctuary, then smaller areas like Athenus, Slaughter Star 3000 and each of the six proving grounds. Locations are discovered easily. You essentially just have to exist in the space and turn the map blue. Undiscovered areas will be grey and walking through them will discover that area. You'll usually be notified, literally with an area discovered pop-up, but a few places will count as discovered even without that. With that simplicity in mind, why would this be something we'd need to search online. Well, dear listener, there are a few locations surely designed to be googled. Tiny areas in Pandora such as Logan Star, Comrades Hold and General's Perch. Promethea has Katagawa's Pleasure Pit, Eden 6 has Jason's Waterfalls and Slickhouse Garage. Particularly if you're playing in co-op and your partner runs to do quests in certain areas or hands in quests in places you've never been before, you will likely miss many of these even if they're technically unmissable. There are indicators that you can use to check your progress on discovered locations, but they too can bug. Some places can register as discovered, but you still need to run back into them a few times for it to properly register. Some patches flat out stop this trophy from working in the first place. The best way to check what you have and what you haven't got is simply to run from place to place, discovering every location as you go. Just load in, run through the affected area and see if any locations count as discovered. If not, you might even have to go into New Game Plus. With Master of All You Survey, it's hard to know whether you've missed something, whether you need to patch the game, whether you need to hop into New Game Plus, or whether it's broken at all. And that's where Google comes in. The Sexy Brew Tale is a game I was sceptical of when I first saw it. It was recommended to me, I had no idea whether I'd like it, and picking it up for the first time and loading into that first gameplay sequence, I did not feel particularly convinced. If I hadn't been streaming it, I might have just put it down. Isometric, top-down puzzle game? Nah. But it was Platmus. We were trying to get a bunch of platinum trophies in the run-up to Christmas, my chat had helped me bankroll it, and well, you know what, I love it, and I recommend it to anyone who will listen to me. I think it's almost a perfect game, especially for what it sets out to achieve. It's a polished, well-rounded experience, and despite being a short one, it was so memorable. I can't compliment it enough, I don't even want to spoil it, because I genuinely recommend you go play it, but for the sake of this video, I'll describe it as loosely as I can. The Sexy Brew Tale is a game about a series of murders that all take place within a single day. The catch? It's Groundhog Day. The day resets over and over and over, and these deaths happen on schedule every single day at exactly the same time, in exactly the same way. As you're walking around the mansion trying to figure out how to stop each death, you'll hear people die around you. It's wild. The art style is beautiful, the soundtrack is incredible, incredible and the gameplay is one in a million. I've never played anything like it and god knows I never will again. I figured out each puzzle as organically as I could, I mean I had Twitch chat with me so there was help, but I'll be damned if I didn't love every second of that authentic experience. One thing however I could not get the authentic experience with, and that was the collectibles. For the trophy full deck you need to find every single playing card in the game. There are 52 in total, an actual full deck of playing cards, and there's no way to keep track of which ones you've collected, so you either keep an eye on them from the start or you frantically google it at the end. Some of them are tucked away in fireplaces, fireplaces that will be lit throughout the course of the day, so you need to get there before the enemy characters do. One is found in a dumbwaiter and will be swapped out very early on for a different item. Some cards are found on ghosts you can speak to. One becomes available when you turn a security camera off. One is only found after you let a character die. If you're keeping track of them as you go, you might not need to Google this, but honestly, you might need to Google the achievement first just to know that you need to keep track of them in the first place. Otherwise, if you're like me and you've got one card left and you've been looking for two hours straight, well, off to Google with you. Of all the 
things you'd expect to have to Google in a Souls-like game, endings are probably not one of them, but not with Sekiro. The binary choice of sit or don't sit that concluded our experience back in the 2011 Dark Souls release is a thing of the past, and now we need to do a lot of eavesdropping, a lot of rice trading if we want to get every trophy on the list. So let's say you've grabbed every ending in the game besides Return. You've scratched your head, you've pondered, you've looked around, but you're not sure how to do it. Oh, well, you obviously should have just known what to do, it's not even a hidden ending. I'll remind you. If you want to earn the Return ending of Sekiro, you need to do the following. Before defeating the mid-game boss, you have two completely random steps you need to take care of. The first is mandatory and will break the ending if you don't do it now, but the second is a bit more flexible. Firstly, you need to talk to a random unnamed old woman who is praying near the Ashna Castle idol. Why? I actually don't know. But what I do know is that if you don't speak to her before the boss, she will move and you're completely locked out of the ending. So yeah, sorry if you missed that step. New game plus cycle for you. Secondly, you need to grab a copy of the holy chapter infested from Sembo Temple. If you're early enough, it'll be on a monk. If you're late, you'll have to learn how to swim underwater and then find it at the bottom of a pond in a place you've already been. Easy. Later in the game, you'll meet a divine child and she will give you some rice. Yes, you can eat it. In fact, you need to. Take the rice, eat the rice, refresh the map, ask for rice. Repeat until the divine child gets tired of your neediness and pretends to go to sleep so that you leave her alone. Turns out you've given her the ick, so now you need to feed her a persimmon. She will give you rice as a thanks, but it's specifically rice for Kuro, so for the ending you want, you now need to deliver some rice to Kuro. This rice is actually time sensitive and needs to be delivered before you beat one of the final bosses. Kuro will be overjoyed and will give you his balls in return, specifically some sweet rice balls, and you can now dutifully return to the divine child to let her know that you ran the errand she asked you to run. Give her the infested book you picked up earlier and she'll move to a previous area. You just have to know where she is, I don't think she says. Speak to her there again and she'll tell you to seek out a high senpo priest. You need to head to a cave you may have already been in to find a text called Dragon's Return. It doesn't spawn until now, so you might just assume that this cave is empty. Once you get back to her, she'll tell you that she needs two serpent viscera. Well, that's kind of easy, I guess. The first one you get naturally by killing the serpent in the story. The second, however, is absurdly well hidden. Stupidly hidden away. Behind a kite puzzle and deep in a cave you'd never even know existed. You give her the viscera and then you need to eavesdrop on her. Yes, there is an eavesdrop mechanic in Sekiro. No, it's not often flagged. Much, much later in the game, come back long after you've forgotten all about her and she'll give you frozen tears that you can use at the end of the game. And boom, an ending. Wasn't that simple? Now for something a bit more basic, but still something I never considered possible. Crash Bandicoot 2 is the second in the Crash Bandicoot trilogy, a huge step down difficulty-wise from Crash Bandicoot 1, but still offering a healthy challenge and introducing a ton of new mechanics. Mainly the ability to move in more directions than just side-scrolling or desperate run towards the camera. Unfortunately, it wasn't my favourite. Squished between the behemoth Crash 1 and the more memorable Crash 3, Crash 2 faded into obscurity, the forgotten middle child. And in this forgotten middle child game, Crash Bandicoot 2 offers you the chance to earn a trophy called called Cortex Infuriated. The description reads, just forget it, repeatedly. Hmm. Usually in Crash games, miscellaneous trophies can be found in levels, but which levels would fulfil this criteria? Probably one with Cortex, right? You potentially might be scouring these levels for Cortex-related easter eggs, maybe a hidden area with him or a poster with his face on, something that you can interact with, but it's not that deep. For the trophy Cortex Infuriated, you need to start the game and specifically not collect any crystals, so you might even miss this without realising. In fact, you need to either quit the level or miss it entirely on purpose. Every time you do this, Cortex will get angrier and angrier with you. After the third crystal miss, Cortex will get so wound up with you that he'll give up on you and the trophy will pop. For those of you who are absolutely terrified of disapproval from a parental figure, this one will be almost impossible for you due to your need to please, but you have to do it for the trophy. I know it's hard. And that's it for our top 10 trophies that I can't believe you'd ever have gotten without googling it. A list of the most obscure trophies out there with requirements only the most dedicated fans would get. The strangest collectibles, the most complex routes, the kinds of map combing a bloodhound would be jealous of. And if you enjoyed the video, please remember to like, leave a comment about your own puzzling trophies, and subscribe to me here on YouTube. Like I said way back at the start of this video, I post all kinds of gaming content as often as I can, so if that appeals to you, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss another upload from me. If you've got any ideas for lists you'd like to see, let me know and I'll see about making them here. Moreover, if you want to see me puzzling over behemoth puzzles like this real time, check me out on Twitch TV over at twitch.tv slash KK, where I stream every other day at 7pm UK time. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.